Hello, and welcome to Other Voices, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. I'm your host, Paul George. On this month's edition of Other Voices, we're going to refocus on Syria. Following the horrific uh, attacks in Paris two weeks ago, Syria is back in the news. Unfortunately, it's also back in the sights of the world's militaries. To help us find our way through this morass, this tangled web of uh, war and revenge and attacks, um, we're re really glad to be joined for the first time on Other Voices by Reese Ehrlich. Reese, welcome to Other Voices. Pleasure to be here. Reese is an award-winning uh, foreign correspondent, an independent print and radio journalist, and author of several books, including his most recent one, Apropos, Inside Syria. Um, this came out this year, was it? Oh, or, late last year. Late last year. So we'll talk some more about what's in here. Um, and you have just been in the area, so let's start there. You were just in Jordan and Iraqi Kurdistan exactly. in, in October, just last month. Well, the most uh, striking thing that I saw were the refugees. Uh, we've heard about, of course, the issue of uh, refugees flooding into Europe. It's become an issue in the United States. Uh, it's controversial here if the U.S. would except 10,000 refugees. Right. There's 1.4 million refugees just in Jordan. Just in There's Jordan. There's over 2 million in Turkey. There's over a million in Lebanon. And they've been there since 2012. That's 4 million people plus yes. we're talking uh, and, about. And uh, roughly half the population of Syria has been displaced, either by uh, becoming refugees in neighboring countries or internally. Be, internally yeah. yeah. And I visited the Zatari uh, camp. How many people is half the population? Ru well, roughly 10 million. Uh, 10, 11 million. Nobody has ex precise figures, but yeah. in that range. And so I visited uh, the Zatari camp in Jordan, and I visited uh, with some of the refugees in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. And it's quite striking that the war is continuing, the refugee crisis is continuing, and it kind of puts it in perspective about how the United States has been basically done nothing to help the refugees, and certainly the the settlement program here is is nothing compared to what other countries are facing. It, it's symbolic. Yeah. We're arguing over mere symbolism, I think, when we're talking about 10,000 Syrian Exactly, refugees. and the idea that somehow terrorists would infiltrate a program that takes four years, two to four years, to be able to come into the country is just laughable. Were, were you in the, the refugee camps? I was. Did you get a chance to talk to some of the refugees and maybe some people who are in the middle of that process? Yeah, I did. Uh, I went to the Zatari camp. There was about... Um, Let's see, close to, if I remember right, 20,000, no, sorry, um, 80,000 80, uh, in that one camp. And the UNHCR, the UN agency that deals with refugees, uh, accepts applications uh, for political asylum. And you can apply not only to the United States, but to European countries and elsewhere in the world. And I did meet some people who were applying, but it's a very lengthy process. Mm -hmm. uh, first, to even be select the UN vets you to even see if you're qualified. And that eliminates something like 95% of the people who apply. And then the... What, what kind of thing gets you disqualified? Well, if you're considered an economic refugee, in order to enter the United States, you have to be a political refugee, yeah. which proves you have to have a well-founded fear of persecution. persecution. And th legally, that's not so easy to prove. Uh, so there's a... And then if somehow you are accepted, you have to go do an interview at a U.S. Uh, embassy somewhere, uh, and you have to travel to there, in this case to Amman, Jordan. Uh, and then you're left in limbo for quite some time, and then you go back for another interview and so on. So the idea that some terrorist would use this as a method to infiltrate the United States is just laughable. Yeah, I take it the embassy is not sending ref refugees to, to the camps to help. You mean sending representatives? Uh, sending yeah. representatives to the refugee not camps. Not to my knowledge. Yeah, not making it any easier. No. What about the, we're really seeing the, the images of the thousands and thousands of refugees flooding into Europe. Are they coming from these camps or are they just fleeing Syria straight and not even bothering with the camps? Do you have a sense of that? Well, it, it's complicated. <coughs> the um, people want to leave the camps if they can because uh, there's no jobs and you're basically completely dependent on uh, handouts from various UN or Jordanian government uh, agencies. More, the majority of Syrians in Jordan are living in the cities, 
a kind of a meager existence. They're working at uh, low-paying jobs, crowding into apartments, uh, do, you know, kind of surviving as best they can. Yeah. Um, now, some Jer Syrians in Jordan have actually been leaving to go back to Syria, about 100 a day uh, from the camp. And this was quite fascinating. So one theory is that they're going back because it's somewhat more peaceable in the southern part of uh, Syria, around the city of Dara. The government doesn't have control of it, and some people have gone back. Another theory, and I think this is more likely, is they're actually transiting all the way through Syria to Turkey, then from Turkey to the, to the coast then, of Turkey, and then, then to, to Greece, yeah. uh, and so on, and, and into Europe. And you can imagine how desperate you've got to be if you will go through war-torn Syria to be able to escape Syria. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and, you, and I talked to people who, not people who did it directly, but who had family members who had done it, and there's like five, uh, at least five checkpoints that you go through on this road, because what you do is you go up through southern Syria, through Damascus, then exit up towards Aleppo, and eventually uh, through up to the Turkish border, and you're facing bribes that you have to pay to the Syrian government, bribes you have to pay to the Free Syrian Army, one of the rebel groups, yeah. bribes you have to pay to the ISIS, bribes you have to pay to the al-Nusra Front. So each, as you Depending pass through what area, area you are. You're, you're going through, you have to pay, and that's not even counting the money then you have to pay to a smuggler once you get to Turkey to get you across the, the sea. To yeah. Greece, so yeah. these are some very, very des desperate folks. Wow. Wow. Um, do they, are they aware of the, uh, the controversy here in the United States over the meager number? Or Yeah, some of the, they're much more in tune to what's going on in Europe, actually, because that's where most of them are headed. But yes, they are aware of the controversy here. So, and they know it's not going to be easy in Europe either. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it, it's also very hard to get political asylum in Europe. Uh, it, it, in general, it's a hard um, hurdle to crawl, to jump. Yeah. But uh, that's why so many are simply er, uh, entering Europe Ill illegally or without documents or without official permission. And so far, they've been allowed to get into some parts of Europe, not others. And even those places like Germany are starting to close the doors. Yeah, just another sign of how desperate they are to, yeah. to flee what's going on around them. Um, I was trying to catch up with some of your articles that were Dateline, Jordan, and um, and from uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. One of the things you seem to be focusing on is uh, recruiting for the various forces in Syria that's going on in Jordan and to mm -hmm. some extent within in these refugee camps. I did a story for Vice News, yeah. uh, uh, for their online uh, uh, publication, and what I found was that both sides, or all sides, are recruiting in Jordan. And it's not surprising, because whenever you have a refugee population, the various combatants try to use it as a way to recruit. Mm -hmm. So the United States, since about 2012, has been, the CIA has been running a program. A billion dollars has been spent so far. A billion dollars. One, B, one billion with a B, big time billion. <laughs> and. What they've done is they, from the refugee camps, from the cities where the Syrians are living, they find people that they think um, will be follow the pro-U.S. line. These are the moderate rebels. That um, we keep hearing that, about, that we keep hearing never about. quite seen. <laughs> and there's a reason we don't, because once the rebels hear, or the potential rebels hear what the U.S. wants them to do, they're really not all interested. And infamously... Such as what? Well, for example... You know, the U.S. isn't recruiting people to promote democracy in Syria. They're, promote, they're recruiting people to promote the U.S. line in Syria. So in a broad sense, the Syrians know that the U.S. backs Israel, which occupies Syrian land, the Golan. Mm -hmm. The U.S., the, the Syrian uh, people know that the U.S. invaded and occupied Afghanistan and Iraq. So it's a big joke that the United States is supporting democracy. Look, they, I've had people tell me, did you want to promote democracy like you have in Afghanistan or in Iraq? <laughs> you know, the people are not stupid. Uh, no. Okay. And then in the immediate sense, the U.S. one year ago shifted its line and said Assad is not the enemy, ISIS is the main enemy. And they, they see Assad. And they see Assad as that's the enemy. And that's a huge, started. huge difference. So when they're being recruited, they're being recruited to go in and attack the Islamic State or ISIS or ISIL. Whereas what they want to do is they want to go in and fight Assad. And that difference is no small 
uh, has no small practical implications. And so the United States has trained hundreds of people, most of whom, have, when they've entered Syria, have been captured by one of the other rebel groups and immediately turned all their weapons over. Yeah. And so one of the most fascinating interviews I did was with a top al-Qaeda leader. You remember al-Qaeda? Yeah. Remember, remember, that was our previously most dangerous enemy. Yeah. Now it's Islamic State. So they've kind of taken second place. So I talked with a high level, and you know what he told me? He told me that he criticizes the Obama administration for being too weak need in Syria. Really? It sounds, you know, he thinks the U.S. <laughs> should have provided Stinger missiles, you know, these shoulder-fired uh, missiles that will bring down airplanes and helicopters. It should have established a no-fly zone in northern Syria. I said, why in... He sounds like a Republican candidate for president. He does. <laughs> it, it is, he sounds exactly like John McCain, McCain and Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Let's not forget the hawk, Democratic hawks. Yeah. So why would al-Qaeda, which of course has its own affiliate in Syria, it's called the al-Nusra Front, why would the al-Nusra Front want to have stronger U.S. presence? Because they know that these so-called moderate rebels have no popular support that as soon as they come in with the Stinger missiles, they're going to get turned over to al-Nusra. And as soon as a no-fly zone is set up, if it weakens the Assad government, they will come to power, not the pro-U.S. moderates. That at least is the thinking. I'm not saying that would actually happen. Mm -hmm. But they are certainly stronger politically and militarily than anything the United States has put forward. And the so-called, you know, uh, it was admitted by the Secretary of Defense, uh, Ash Carter, in a recent congressional hearing, the U.S. has today five, five moderate rebels in all of Syria. Powerful now, force. Five, five <laughs> not 50, not 5,000, five. And that's after a billion dollars in Jordan and a half a billion dollars in Turkey. That's how your tax dollars are at work, folks. And who else is recruiting? Well, on this front and the Islamic State, these right-wing extremist groups are also rec uh, recruiting in Syria, like, sorry, in Jordan. Uh, and they, uh, again, there's a town north of Amman called Zarqa, where I interviewed this al-Qaeda leader, actually two al-Qaeda leaders. By the way, how do you go about getting an interview with a top al-Qaeda leader? <laughs> it was quite Is a, it in the yellow pages, al-Qaeda? Yeah, you, yeah well, you kind of look them up, al-Qaeda leader, phone number, and ah, they want, you know, got to pay extra money for the phone number, you know, how you call up information, they don't have it. <laughs> um, what I did, I had made an uh, an appointment with one, he's a medical doctor who uh, has a clinic in Sarka, and he was, he's known as an Al-Qaeda leader. And when I got on the, Amman, out of Amman, and we're on the way to see him, we called. And he says, oh yeah, why don't you meet us at Abu Qatada's house? Now, Abu Qatada is the guy who's the top, one of the top Al-Qaeda leaders in uh, Jordan. He was living in Britain. He had advocated and helped organize suicide attacks. He was expelled from Britain after a long be uh, legal battle. You can look it up. It was a very, very famous uh, case, yeah, infamous case about it, yeah. Yeah, in Britain. He ended he's a, up in he's a cleric, right? Yeah, he's a cleric, yes. And he was the, ex the spiritual advisor to the shoe bomber, uh, you know, th things like that. Yeah. And so he, we, we, we got to his house. Now, when I got, I was with my fixer, you know, the guy who arranges the interviews and translates. And he says, we're going to go to Abu Qatada's house. I said, that's good. He says, Reese, do you know what this means? I said, what? He says, Abu Qatada doesn't talk to anybody. This is, this is a huge scoop. Uh, and he also then became very worried because he was afraid that the Jordanian uh, Mubaharat, the uh, Secret Service, uh, would be following us or it would be uh, as a result of this. But it was all set up in a matter of 20 minutes. We get, <laughs> we get to the guy's house. And he says he doesn't want to do the interview. <laughs> he changed his mind. So I interviewed the other guy. And in the course of doing the other interview, I turned to him. I took my microphone because this was for radio. And I said, um, well, what do you think? You know, what do you think of the human rights situation in Syria? And he answered. And then I did a follow-up question. And pretty soon, you we, had, had an we had an interview. <laughs> so the lesson, folks, is never take no for an answer. <laughs> so everybody is in Jordan and presumably in the other refugee camps in Lebanon. Yeah, yeah. And in the refu to be fair, the UN says there's no recruitment allowed uh, in, their, in the camps. So it's not like they have an office <laughs> or, a, right. or a table with a sign-up sheet. Uh, but the recruiting is going on. I, I learned from some intelligence sources in, in Jordan. It's just clandestine. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, you can't, uh, to be fair to the UN, they can't be in every household and uh, watch You're everybody, nor should they. Conversation. Yeah, nor should they be. Right. Uh, but yes, so recruitment continues there. And of course, the majority of Syrians are living not in the camps, but in other cities. And they're recruited and then they're taken across uh, uh, clandestinely to fight in Syria. With whomever they've With, signed yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. And you were also in Iraqi Kurdistan. Yes. What did you learn there? Well, I focused a lot of my uh, reporting on the Syrian Kurds who are fighting Assad and the Islamic State. They now control an area in the northern part of uh, Syria where the Kurds live. It's almost contiguous with the exception of one uh, area. And that's a pretty big uh, victory because the Islamic State had controlled a number of the border crossings between Turkey and Syria. And so the fact This that, is uh, the Rojava area? Yes. Uh, Rojava is the name that this particular Syrian rebel group gives to the Kurdish region of, of, of Syria. It's a controversial name because other groups don't use that name, but they certainly refer to it as Rojava. And the area is, the, the leading party there is the PYD, the Democratic Union Party, which is affiliated with the Kurdistan Workers Party of Turkey, which is the PKK. And it's a very controversial group because they used to be Marxists who were, had blended Marxism and nationalism. They gave up the Marxism. They even read uh, some anarchists. And uh, so their politics are very confusing to people on the outside. The, the, um, this past Sunday's cover story in the New, New York, York Times, Times Magazine, did you see that? I did. Uh, very interesting. They, they even studied Murray Bookchin. Yes, good old Murray Bookchin, <laughs> the uh, U.S. anarchist. Yeah. I don't did, think, did you make it to Rojava to I, observe I did. I was, I've been offered several trips to go there, but I did not. Um, it's, uh, it's, while well, it's the, probably the safest part of Syria for a foreign reporter, it's still dangerous. The front line is not far away. Yeah, and, and for example, you've all heard of the city of Kobani, where this horrific battle took place in January and the, the Kurds won against the Islamic State. What you may not have heard of is that in July of this year, the, the uh, Islamic State infiltrated back into Kobani wearing uniforms of the, guerrilla, of the Kurdish guerrillas and killed two, they massacred 250 civilians. Wow. Uh, so even though the, uh, the rebel... Uh, Forces would do a lot to protect reporters, and that is appreciated. There, there are things that are outside their control. But for the most part, they've secured some of their own territory yes. there. Um, they've set up some kind of yes. political system that they call widely democratic based on uh, municipal councils. They're very dedicated to inclusion, so mm -hmm. it's not just yeah. Kurds. Yeah. And Take not, that all with a grain of salt. Yeah. I, the, <laughs> the, the article in the New York Times made that clear, that yeah. some of these claims are stretching it a, yeah, a little exactly. bit. But. I mean, it, to be fair, in an area where you've got right-wing megalomaniacs who are assassinating people by beheading them and uh, forcing women into uh, rape marriages, to have anybody who considers themselves secular and willing to work with other ethnicities and religions, that's a big step forward. Uh, this is an area of some very, very bad characters. Uh, and I've had a chance to interview quite a few of the, both the rebels, the rebel supporters, the, the leaders of the PYD. Um, and uh, I think they're very sincere folks who are, who are sincere about fighting ISIS. Um, I think the, the problem areas, uh, they are very extremely sectarian. No other Kurdish group is allowed to, or political party is allowed to work there. And mm. they have this cult of personality around Abdullah Oshalan, the leader. Uh, you see his portrait everywhere, the quoting of the words of uh, Oshalan. I learned a long time ago, don't trust any place, any party that has a cult of personality. Yeah. That personality is going to go south on you folks. <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah. Um, uh, and they're ne they now have a system of conscription, forced conscription, where anybody uh, who's a young male of a certain age who doesn't have, a, and with certain exceptions, uh, is, is forcibly conscripted into the guerrilla forces, which is the, actually of guerrilla armies that I know of. I can't think of, as, of another rebel force in other parts of the world that do that. And it's not exactly anarchist principles to have forced conscription. Yeah. Uh, but like I said, um, uh, they, they, their strongest basis of, of popular support is that they are strong militarily and have defended the region from the Islamic State and from other 
right-wing groups. And the fact that you can live peaceably in your village because these guys are around, that's, that says a lot for you. Yeah. Now, the Kurds, of course, are what a lot of people in the United States are, are seeing as our boots on the ground there. Um, that, that's the indigenous force that, that is going to be needed to confront ISIS on the mm -hmm. ground. And to a certain extent, that's been the case. It's been the Kurds who have been most successful yes. in Syria and in Iraq. Uh, and, yep. and in Iraq. Um, but another recent article that um, you had that I found uh, fascinating published at uh, Politico is that the Russians are kind of interested in Kurdish boots on the ground, too. Can you yes. get into that a little bit? This is, this is another no, recruiting nobody, kind uh, of... Nobody can say the Middle East is easy. <laughs> <laughs> in case Which, you didn't think it was complicated... Mm, that's uh, why we asked you here. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. So the U.S. has a military alliance with the Kurdish rebels. They do not have a political alliance. And that's mainly because the rebels are affiliated with this PKK, which the U.S. considers a terrorist group. Terrorist group. And the Turks consider the PKK to be a bigger danger than ISIS or the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. And while the United States is dropping weapons to aid the Syrian rebels, who are, let's call them PKK for a moment, the Turks are bombing the very same rebels. Right. And they're bombing the PKK in Turkey. So the United States is not going to, at least for the moment, recognize the rebels in Syria in a political sense, which is what they want. So they much for they, democracy. Yeah, right. And they want, for example, some of the, oh, let us open up a, a legal office in Washington so we can, uh, you know, meet with people and raise funds or whatever they want to do. The U.S. won't let them do it. Uh -huh. They did open a, an office in Moscow. Uh -huh. Now, the Russians are very clever. They see... They, of course, back Assad. But they also hate the Islamic State. And they want to limit U.S. influence in whatever government eventually emerges in Syria. So they see the Kurds as a possible force that they might be able to ally with. So they've extended political recognition, but haven't provided military support yet. <laughs> it's just the flip side of what the yeah. United States has done. At some point in the future, they might provide military aid, and the Kurds would welcome it. Yeah. Uh, but between the two, the Kurds are getting what they need, political recognition <laughs> from one and weapons from they, the other. They would prefer to have, the, I think they would prefer to side with the United States. Uh -huh. And ironically, uh, once more, the United States has managed to figure out a way to alienate the people who want to ally with them. Um, and I, I tell them, you know, you can't, t you can't trust the United States. The U.S. has stabbed the Kurds in the back in the past. And they know it. And they know it, and they want to forget about it. They oh, that was under Kissinger and under previous regimes. There was an infamous time when the Kurds, this was the Iraqi Kurds, were um, allied with the United States, and the U.S. helped broker a deal between Iraq and Iran at that time under the Shah and Saddam Hussein, and they gave the Kurds like four hours notice that they were going to come under attack, and they had to flee because Kissinger stabbed them in the back. And they haven't forgotten or no, forgiven. They, they, they have not forgotten, but they tend to argue, well, that was a long time ago and th things are different now. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So um, I want to get to audience questions um, pretty soon because we have a lot of people here and I'm sure they have a lot of questions. But um, looking at, at the big picture thing, thing um, it gets simplified so much here, especially in the mainstream media. And because we have a presidential campaign going on, so much gets reduced to sound bites. Um, so, but as, as I look at it, you know, obviously it's not, and you've, you've made references to this already, it's, there isn't just one war in Syria. If, if you watch the evening news here, you would think, ISIS is the problem, and the U.S. is attacking ISIS, and Britain is voting tomorrow on whether to send jets, and... Um, Germany now has announced it's going to send uh, ground troops. Ger yeah, ground troops. Yeah, I haven't seen yeah, that, yeah, that just was, uh, I think, today. Oh, I missed that one today. That's good news. What do we know? Oh, yes, the Wehrmacht is on the march again. <laughs> just what we're looking forward to. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I thought their uh, constitution... Uh, They're going to put it to a vote of parliament. It was uh -huh. a decision by the cabinet 
uh, they're not supposed to be engaging in, in combat, uh, but they're sending armed troops. So they'll and, be doing intelligence like, like and, our yeah, special yeah, ops. Right, they're sending like a the frigate, and or uh, the plan is, because it hasn't been approved yet, but the plan is send a frigate, a Navy frigate, and a number of airplanes to do reconnaissance and uh, intelligence gathering in the, uh, in the area around Turkey, the Turkish-Syrian border, and the Iraqi-Kurdish border in that area. Yeah. And then, I, well, then again, uh, Britain is voting tomorrow yes. in Parliament on um, sending a force that will actually... I mean, th it's the same dynamic in all of these countries that's going on in the United States, yeah. which is there was this horrific attack in Paris. Has to be responded uh, to. Something it. must... We must do something. We're, we're weak-kneed and, and willy-nilly, you know, and uh, uh, if we don't respond, and the response has to be military. And so the debate in Washington and London and, uh, and Berlin is between some intervention and a whole bunch of intervention. It's nothing, the consideration of, like, we shouldn't intervene at all, we should take political diplomatic measures, that's not even a discussion on the table. Um, to his credit, Obama has not decided to send in, you know, 10 or 50,000 troops into Syria. Uh, but the slippery slope has started. We have 50 commandos who are, are combat troops for all intents and reasons in Syria. We have 3,500 ground troops who are combat troops in Iraq. They're now, uh, they've just announced that they're going to increase that number uh, some more. And the Republicans are saying, ha, that's enough. We need 10,000. Yeah. Right? Whatever Obama says, they, they want to double it. Like somehow that's going to work. The only way the United States can win the war in Iraq and Syria is by sending in 100, 2,000, 200,000 troops and permanently occupy those countries. That would do. We have a strong enough military, we could do that. And then, of course, we'd have, we'd be bogged down in a financial crisis, uh, unnecessary deaths of civilians and American soldiers for eternity. And 10 years or five years from now, we'd be looking at another failed state like exactly, Iraq. Exactly, exactly. And, yeah. and we, no, tried that. Afghanistan. We, tr we tried that in Iraq, remember. We yeah. tried that in Afghanistan. We had won the war in Afghanistan, We'd won, except we didn't. We've now lost the wars in both Afghanistan and Iraq at the cost of several trillion dollars, which this economy cannot afford, uh, and the deaths of countless uh, innocent people. And, and again, when you say the only way the U.S. could win the war in Syria, I, I want to go back to the point that that's only one of the wars. That's right. You they, know, you there's still that. a rebellion actively trying to confront Assad's Syrian Absolutely. army to overthrow the Assad regime. Yes. By the way, you interviewed Assad for your, your previous book back in 2009 or uh, 2000? 2006, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah, I interviewed him twice. What did you think? <sighs> Does any of this surprise you? His it, behavior it, it, after it, the rebellion? It, it, it does not, because he wanted to portray this image of being a secular, reasonable man. He's fluent in English. Um, <laughs> He, I, I wouldn't call him friendly, but he was uh, certainly less imposing and intimidating than his father, Hafez al-Assad, who, after all, was a, a, a Air Force general and, you know, with a, a rough and gruff kind of military guy. But when it came to, like in my interview, I asked him about the Kurds. At that time, roughly 300,000 Kurds were, had no, who were born in Syria, raised in Syria, going back generations, had no Syrian citizenship. And it had to do with a dispute that even predated the Assad's coming to power. But he could have changed that overnight, had he decided. And his basic response in my interview was, what are the Kurds going to do for me? In other words, it's not, there's not a right and a wrong, uh, but rather it's a, it's a, a quid pro quo, quid pro quo yeah. dictatorial perspe perspective. Now, what's the proof that he could have done it? When the out uprising broke out in 2000. 11, overnight, he issued passports and citizenship papers to all the Kurds, you know, or at least to many of the Kurds. who yeah. had. He, he did it in a matter of weeks. That could have been done in 2006. He could have made the refor reforms in the parliament, uh, uh, legalizing political parties, uh, uh, legalizing unions, student associations. He would have been hailed throughout the Middle East for doing that. But it would have shaken his power base in the military, the intelligence services, and the capitalist elite that runs Syria, yeah. and he wasn't willing to take that step.
Going back to our list of wars, we've got the rebellion, Assad fighting back, Russians now they're fighting on Assad's side and a little symbolic bombing of ISIS now and then by, mm -hmm. by the Russians. And you have Turkey actively bombing the Kurds, both yeah. in Turkey and in Syria. Yes, exactly. Um, so when these, especially the people running for president, uh, talk about winning the war in Syria, I wonder, they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, can we reveal that to the audience? Yeah, I, I they think they what they're probably about. know it, but... Yeah, I think they, pro they probably do, but they, they want to go the easy route. Uh, they, they knew that the health care plan was probably going to work, but they chose to vote 157,000 times against it in the House of Representatives, right? And they so still just, are, yeah. And, and they still are, and, and it, yet it's functioning. Um, the Anybody who actually comes into the White House will face the same problems that... Bush did and Obama did now. They've tried all kinds of variations. They've tried invasion and occupation. That didn't work. They've tried drone attacks as kind of uh, invasion light. Mm -hmm. That hasn't worked. I mean, they've killed a lot of people and some leaders have been killed, but it hasn't stopped the insurgency. And putting 10,000 troops on the ground in Syria instead of 50 is not going to solve the problem either. Yeah. And obviously finding local boots on the ground hasn't been working out yeah, very well I mean, either. Yeah, I it, it has it has worked in the sense that the Peshmerga in Iraqi Kurdistan and the Kurdish rebels that I've been talking about um, have uh, effectively fought uh, with the uh, and coordinated with U.S. bombing raids. That's the one uh, area that where the U.S. policy has worked, but it has extreme limitations. The Kurds will not fight outside of the areas in which they plan to keep the territory. And that leaves out Mosul uh, and whole parts of northern Iraq. It leaves out the major cities in Syria, south of the Kurdish area. So the, you're it, talking it, about the places that ISIS is. Holding. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Ex ex exactly. The, those places are not going to be. I mean, the Kurds might participate in the fighting if there was other people as well, but they're not going to fight and hold those areas like they have before. So the U.S. has run up against a wall because there's no other effective fighting forces. In Iraq, it's the Iraqi army is a shambles, yeah. and the effective fighting force are the Iranian allied militias. So Iran, once again, stands to gain more out of the U.S. fight against Islamic State in much of Iraq, uh, as it did from the U.S. invasion of Iraq. You know, the U.S. lost the war in Iraq, fair and square, we pulled the troops <laughs> out, and who was the victor? Iran. It yeah. had more influence in Baghdad than the United States does, even to this day. Continues. Let's get to the audience. Uh, Crystal will come around with a microphone for you. Just raise your hand, and when it does come to you, if you would stand up to make it a little easier for our camera people. So there's one over here to get started. And speak straight into the mic. Hold it close. It's a very interesting presentation. Uh, I have two quick questions. One is... Um, to what extent do you think that uh, Turkey is uh, uh, providing a route for selling oil for the Islamic State is, is important? And the second one is, uh, with Turkey as a member of NATO and shooting down a Russian plane, what is it you think are the chances this might escalate into a larger war involving major nations? Yeah. Uh, for sure, Turkey is uh, receiving oil from the Islamic State. When the Islamic State took over uh, some of the oil producing areas in Syria and in Iraq, uh, they load it onto trucks and ship it out to wherever they can sell it. It's so, it, there's a bit of an exaggeration about how much money they're making off of this because they have to sell it at a super discount because it's illegal oil. But uh, I don't know whether the Turkish government is looking the other way because it's, it's being bought and sold by uh, clandestine uh, uh, oil dealers. And you can't tell where all it comes from, you know, once it's trucked out and disguised. So for sure, some of it is going out to Turkey. Uh, the shooting down of the Russian plane is a very serious incident. If you look at the details, even of what's been revealed so far, it was an ambush. Uh, the, uh, it wasn't like the Russian plane had, in, had flown over Turkey for some minutes and then the Turkish government responded. They claimed that they warned them 10 times. The Russian plane, according to all accounts, was in Turkish territories for 17 seconds. How can you warn somebody 10 times in 17 seconds? It was a, just like a little spit of land yeah, yeah, he, where he, the border just, makes a little Right, they shot over and then they came back again. 
basically what I think happened is the Turks were waiting for an incident, an excuse, to shoot down a Russian plane because they want to intimidate the Russians from bombing the rebel groups in Syria that they support. Mm -hmm. And there's these Turkmen rebels. Turkmen are an ethnic group in the region who are Turkic, Turkish language speakers and they have various ethnic and political ties to Turkey. And Turkey funnels money and arms to them as an anti-Assad force. So the Turks were saying to the Russians, back off, don't bomb these folks. But of course, that's the danger of war. You make what you think is a limited move that's going to send a message, and the message is then taken and shot back at you. And now the Russians, of course, are taking economic sanctions against Turkey, and I wouldn't doubt that they're preparing to uh, various uh, air, air defenses and air attacks against Turkey to prevent that ever happening again. So you have the real danger of a war breaking out with the neighboring countries. And also in this region is where the Russian naval base is. Yes. Let's make a quick note. I've seen that naval base. It's basically a long pier with some repair facilities. I've seen the U.S. naval bases in Bahrain and other places. Now, that's a Navy base. <laughs> you know, thousands of American troops. It can, it can take a whole battle fleet. You know, you can launch your uh, war-making efforts from there. The, the Russian... It is indeed a, a naval base, but it's not much to speak of. Okay, another question, conveniently located right in front of Crystal. What would you do if you were the President of the United States? <laughs> what policy would you carry out? Well, the first thing I would do is try to prevent my assassination by the CIA and the other people who didn't like my policies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but I would um, have a not, an active non-interventionist policy that emphasized po political and diplomatic moves. So what would that mean? I'd stop the bombing of Iraq and Syria. I'd pull out the troops. I'd go to, Syria, to uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, uh, Dubai, and the other U.S. allies who are funding these extremist rebel groups. I'd say, cut it out. You've got 24 hours, or we're going to cut off all of our military arms to you. We're going to make sure your planes never take off again, which, by the way, the United States can do. In Saudi Arabia, for example, the planes are serviced by American technicians who must get permission from the United States government before they service those planes. So in a matter of hours, the U.S. could shut down the Saudi Air Force. Uh, I would then go to the Russians and the Iranians. I'd say, okay, we're serious about non-intervention. -interven now you do the same. You can't use this as the excuse to stick you, keep your guy in power. Um, Based on that, it would change the entire dynamic of all the outside forces intervening. And the next step it would be difficult, but possible, which is to form uh, some kind of a political um, uh, interim government, uh, not a democratic one, but at least one that could provide some stability that would include some elements from the old Assad regime, although I don't think Assad himself, the civil society activists who are not strong but are still a presence in Syria, and the non-extremist rebel groups, uh, of which there are some, uh, and uh, uh, lay the basis for a functioning Syrian government. There would have to be a continued military fight against the Islamic State and against al-Nusra, because I don't think they would give up. I don't think they would participate in a coalition government with other forces. But it could be done by the Syrian people themselves in their own way, which is going to have a much better long-lasting impact than the... Uh, current policy, which is basically to fragment the country. To a certain extent, um, there has been some work on a political approach to this. Mm -hmm. um, the parties, had, you know, with a lot of arm twisting, actually have, have met once. Uh, in Vienna. Uh, yeah, in Vienna, and it took a lot to get Saudi Arabia and Iran and Turkey and Russia all in the same room and, and a number of other other players, and they're, they're going to meet again. It would seem to me that Russia, at least, and it's, it's now playing a major role, could see a, a certain pragmatism in getting rid of Assad in a certain number of months, as, as long as mm -hmm. they have someone there that will continue to back their... Um, their interests, like their their peer, <laughs> as I agree. you just yeah. No, I think it. the Russians and the Iranians too, for that matter. I, they're not wedded to Assad. 
as as the leader. They, they, has, they're, they're not in love with Assad. They're in love with a regime that protects their interests that's in the right. region. Uh, yeah. Exactly right. But does the Turkey Turkey's shooting down of the Russian plane makes that really does difficult. that drive a stake through the yeah, heart I think of that, that, was one of the, that small that the, one the, small the, effort for the moment certainly. Why would the Russians agree to give up uh, to, to kick out Assad when Turkey is saying we're going to win militarily, which is their main goal, you know, and, and bring in our guy into power. And the, the biggest problem in Vienna is not the fact that the content of what was proposed, which by seen in isolation is not a bad idea. The problem is all sides still think they can win militarily. And when you have that going on, you don't have a political settlement. The folks have to realize that they're not going to win militarily. They're, they're, they may not be able to stick to their maximum position, uh, and unfortunately, that's you know, and, and that lays that would then lay the basis for a diplomatic solution. Now, does someone come to that conclusion? I mean, you just look at. Well, uh, you know, some folks uh, out there in, in our audience tonight remember the Lebanese civil war of the 1970s, 80s. That seemed like it would never end. There was kidnapping and bombings and Christians fighting Muslims and right-wing phalanges, Christian groups, and Sunnis and Shias, and it was never, ever going to end, right? 1990, there was a settlement. The various parties were exhausted, realized they couldn't win militarily. The outside powers had basically, after trying to intervene, remember the United States had troops there, and they were blown up in the Beirut bombing and so Beirut on. Beirut bombing. And the French had to, so the, the big foreign powers had to pull out. Syria was still there. But the, the Israelis were forced out, except for a stretch of southern Lebanon. So basically, the various sides figured out they can make get more out of a diplomatic solution than they can by continued fighting. And they met in Saudi Arabia. They signed the Taif Accords. They weren't great. They weren't full, fully implemented. But it brought peace and stability to the country. And for a while, until this most recent Syrian civil war has impacted Lebanon, the country was uh, back on a, I won't say a de democratic footing, I would say st a stable relatively prosperous. They have found a way to they found a way all to these stop pieces. The, to stop the civil war, and that was important. Yeah, it, it's an interesting analogy, Reese, because um, back then, the West was saying, oh, we've got to intervene to do mm -hmm. something here, and they ended up just pulling out um, Yes, they, they cut and run. They, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Our, our great yeah. militarist president, cut and run from Lebanon yeah. after the bombing of the Marine Barracks. And Israel And the French it. cut and run. Yeah. Remember them? And the French the, the, and the, the Israeli. Yeah. Uh, the, they, they took off. And, you know, at the time, after the Marine bombings, there were lots of calls for intensified uh, uh, military action, just yeah. as there are today. Yeah. Send 20,000 yeah. troops. Yeah. It didn't work, folks. It, it never works. Back to the audience. Okay. Thank you. We've heard very little about Israel. Uh, what's their stake in all of this? What's Israel's stake? Um, well, they have uh, occupied and annexed a part of Syrian territory, the Golan. I, had a, I visited there and researching my book, Inside Syria. Um, they are helping some of the rebel groups that they like to fight Assad. They do it both through helping um, provide medical care for people coming across the border from Syria and also by uh, army participating in with the Jordanian and US CIA and Jordan to um, train the so-called moderate rebels uh, Israel of course it, it it doesn't support Assad but it's also wary of these extremist groups uh, who have used the opportunity to launch mortars into the Golan area, of, uh, the occupied part of the Golan in Israel, for example. Um, when I interviewed various former Israeli government officials and other experts, uh, I think the consensus view was they're happy with what's going on now. As long as Syrians are fighting each other, it takes the pressure off Israel. And as long as there's no attacks on Israel itself, um, it, it, they're happy to see to, uh, Syria torn apart. Okay, there was a question over on the side. Uh, Crystal is here. Wait for the microphone so everybody can hear you and hold it right up there. What, uh, what are Turkey's interests in opposing Assad? 
Turkey, at the beginning of all of this, um, it's hard to believe now, but Turkey was being held up as a model of a moderate Muslim government, <laughs> elected government in the region, uh, critical of Israel, uh, broadly supported. They, they had a policy of no enemies. <laughs> this is only five years ago, folks. It's not ancient history. Uh, what happened, and, and they were friend, and uh, um, Erdogan, the at the time prime minister, now president of Turkey, was uh, very, um, had very good relations with Assad. When the uprising began some months into it, Erdogan figured the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria was going to come to power. The Muslim Brotherhood in Syria is very close to Hamas in Palestine and very close to the uh, AK party in Turkey, Erdogan's party. And they thought it was only a matter of months until Assad was out and the Muslim Brotherhood came, in pow it came into power and Turkey would have a strong ally in next door. It didn't work out that way. Uh, uh, Assad uh, held on for much longer than the Turks or frankly anybody thought. Um, the Turks opened up their borders, helped form the Free Syrian Army based uh, on special training given to former Syrian soldiers. And I talked about their recruitment in Jordan. That same recruitment was going on in Turkey. Um, and now uh, Erdogan is, despite the unpopularity of his policies inside Turkey, is doubled down. Uh, I think shooting down the, the Russian plane is an example of that. I think he's all in. He's got to get rid of Assad now and hope that a party favorable to him comes to power. And I think. They have people that they would prefer to come to power, but they're also hedging their bets. So they're allowing and supporting al-Nusra Front and Islamic State, the extremist groups, uh, as, a, as a fallback plan in case their guys don't win. Uh, and that's one of the dirty little secrets is the Saudis, the, some of the Gulf states, and the Turks are supporting the very extremist groups that the U.S. claims it's fighting, uh, which is one of the reasons the Turks are bombing the Kurds and not bombing the Islamic State, or certainly not in any significant amount of numbers. Ultimately, what do you think uh, Erdogan's goals are with regard to the, to the Kurds? This is a struggle he's been fighting for a long time. It's been a brutal war there. They had uh, a ceasefire, basically, a, you know, a peaceful standoff. Uh, now he sees them, as you mentioned earlier, getting shipments of U.S. arms from one flight overhead, and he's flying and, and bombing them in, in right. Syria. Uh, repression is back in, in Turkey. The, the bombing yeah. of, a, a, of a PKK peace rally uh, has been pinned on ISIS that the Kurds say uh, because— Makes no sense. And the assassination of a, of a Kurdish lawyer just yeah. in the last few days in Diyarbakir. Yeah. I think at a certain point, Erdogan made a decision that this democracy stuff wasn't working uh, and that he couldn't have enough power going through the Constitution, parliamentary elections, etc. And he's now decided to manipulate whatever he has to to provide more and more power to himself. So we see that by doubling down in Syria against Assad, but also at home. He br intentionally broke the ceasefire with the PKK. There was, uh, uh, they weren't shooting each other. There yeah. was not a political settlement. Right. There had been talks on and off, and I think they could have proceeded. But he broke them off. He attacked the PKK, knowing that they would be uh, fighting back. And, uh, and uh, several and Kurdish parties actually had been rather successful exactly. in parliamentary elections exactly. preceding in the, that. And, and in order to uh, basically annul the results of the previous elections, he whipped up nationalist sentiment in Turkey. He mobilized his base among conservative uh, political Islamists and managed to uh, reverse the results of the early elections, I think they were June, uh, and, and get his party a much stronger uh, role in parliament. And he now wants to change the parliament, the, the constitution, to give the president, i.e. him, yeah. much more powers, much more power. uh, yeah. more dictatorial, quasi-dictatorial powers. And so where the Turks, uh, where the Kurds fit into this is they've been an effective pawn. Uh, it's not unlike we see with Donald Trump here, which is there's a crisis. What do you do? Have the Muslims register. Yeah. Right? Or, or, build, or a build a wall. That'll stop them. Yeah. Uh, whereas, uh, in the fact, you could say, you could say Erdogan is the Donald Trump of Turkey or vice versa. I don't know which. 
But anyway, uh, and you Just whip as up as long as Donald Trump doesn't become the <laughs> Erdogan of the United yeah, yeah. States, exactly. i.e. president. Exactly. So you whip up nationalist sentiment, you go to war, you get people scared, and you try to use that to win elections. All right. Back to our audience over here. Crystal, you probably can't see the hand. Okay. Thank you. I um, was wondering about the bombings. Uh, Russians are bombing somebody. The U.S. is bombing somebody. Lots of aerial bombs, barrel bombs, and so on. What I haven't heard so much in the news media is the people on the ground. How many of the people on the ground are actually uh, militants and soldiers and fighters, and how many are just civilians yeah. getting caught in the mess? You're right. There's something like over a dozen countries now bombing Syria. Uh, the, the main folks are the U.S., of course, uh, who say they're only attacking al-Nusra and Islamic State, the Russians, who are bombing anybody who opposes Assad, and Assad, the Assad Air Force itself, which use these horrible barrel bombs. And then there's lots of the Turks and Emiratis and Saudis and others who were, were at one time or now the French and the British who are bombing uh, Syria as well or about to in the case of Britain. Um, it's very hard to get statistics about civilians. I'm sure more civilians are dying than uh, fighters. And in the Islamic State controlled areas it's very hard to get the statistics out because they haven't been real communicative with the Western press. We do hear uh, a lot of the um, examples of the uh, attacks by the Assad forces, um, most recently a uh, MSF, Madison Saint Fontaine, uh, hospital was bombed, I think, I want to say Homs. Anyway, one of, the Syrian right. one of the Syrian cities was barrel bombed by the Assad government. Uh, so they know that and it was an attack on a civilian hospital. Uh, and the Russian bombing has also killed a lot of civilians as well. But total statistics, at least I've not seen uh, the figures other than to know in these kind of situations, many more civilians die than fighters. Yeah, I've looked for those statistics as well. You know, there have been some uh, groups, independent groups, doing good reporting on like drone strikes mm -hmm. in Pakistan. But if you can't get on the ground and interview witnesses and who is that, you know, which of your neighbors died. There's no way to develop yeah. these numbers, but the numbers of refugees that you saw in the camps and on the border and going back in tells you something about yeah, exactly. the amount of civilian suffering going on there, clearly. Um, there, there are statistics on the number of airstrikes. These are just U.S. airstrikes, Syria 2,800 since this started, and uh, 5,400 in Iraq. That's. Um, but those are all targeted only killing evil people. Yes, with our, our with, bombs, only with the smart Russians. Bombs. Russians kill good people, we don't kill good people. Yeah. It's just this important distinction to remember. Our, our bombs are smarter. That's right, we've got some. We, got, we have, that's because they've got dumb bombs. Yeah, yeah, and we have Silicon Valley. We've got time for one more question. Come on, all you people out there can come up. One more back here. Uh, what do you think the chances are that Turkey? is going to end up putting boots on the ground if they don't like the way things end up? Well, anything is possible. I, I think they would prefer not to, just like the, no, nobody, <laughs> everybody realizes what uh, difficulties would confront anybody fighting in Syria, especially in limited numbers. But they might, and I could see it particularly if the Kurds continue to make advances, the, the Kurdish, Syrian Kurdish rebels, and um, uh, the bombing doesn't stop them. Uh, the uh, the pressure would be on to do something. You know, these terrorists are on our border. And we've got to stop them. And the PKK is aligned with the PYD in Syria. You know, do something. It would cause a lot of friction with the U.S. for them to do that. So there's a number of factors, and and a, a lot of their people would get killed, uh, which ultimately, of course, would have a very negative, not only humanitarian but political consequences. So. Uh, for the moment, I don't see it happening. It, could, it, is, it is possible in the future. So a couple of last closing thoughts. Um, we, we've mentioned in the course of this conversation uh, various domestic politicians here uh, outlining their, their own um, 
solutions to this problem from the McCain, Graham, 20,000 boots on the ground to uh, the uh, Clinton, everybody else, no fly zone. Um, that's supposed to solve things somehow or other. And yet, a year ago, Obama sent a resolution to the Congress to authorize him to use military force in Syria. And nobody even wants to talk about that bill that's been sitting there for a year. Thoughts on that? And yeah, I, Congress I, I, I always wonder, has anybody else noticed that what the U.S. is doing is completely illegal? <laughs> I mean, on what, the grounds on which the Obama administration justifies the air war and now the combat troops is a resolution that was passed against al-Qaeda in, in 2001 after the 9-11 attacks. Over 14 years ago. Yeah, 14 years ago, and it was specifically to go after al-Qaeda. And, and affiliated and, forces. But so you can make it feel everybody in the world that you know Marxist guerrillas in Colombia, I guess, are now affiliated, and the, Ira, the Irish Republican Army in Northern Ireland. You know, anybody that we declare so uh, Islamic State is affiliated. So yeah. they, they, you know, I guess what the, that's why they pay these lawyers a lot of money because they can come up with justifications for torture or anything else, and now they've distorted the law to say that what they're doing is legal. But it is quite interesting that neither the White House nor the Congress really wants to touch the question of an actual vote on the legality of this because it would, I think, focus a lot of uh, discussion in the United States about what the long-term plans are. If we're going to declare war, how are we going to end the war? Right. And nobody has that answer. Or wants to take responsibility. And nobody wants to take, so it's easier to just let it sit there and neither side has much interest in actually pursuing it. I'm afraid we're all out of time. Where are you off to next? Back uh, to the region? I, I will be going back to the Middle East early next year. I can't tell you on air. Okay. It's going to be an exciting trip. We've been talking with Reese Ehrlich, uh, award-winning foreign correspondent and author of Inside Syria. Reese, thanks a lot for joining us here Thank on you. Other Voices. Thank you all for being here.